we spoke recently with Matt Rothwell, who runs the podcast People's History of Ideas, which looks at the development of Maoism in China and beyond. We first asked Matt to tell us what the podcast is about. Well, it's a, the idea with the podcast is to have, you know, to have a podcast that explores the history of ideas about rebellion and revolution, um, and to focus mainly on the history of the development of international Maoism, which is what I've um, mainly spent, what I've specialized in in my research. And so to um, just sort of go back and look at the roots of the the sort of genesis of international Maoism in the sort of oppression of China by foreign powers, uh, you know, going all going back to the Opium War and the British going into China, and then looking at sort of the pile on of all these other big foreign powers, the United States, Japan, France, Russia, and looking at how that whole process of the Chinese people responding to this sort of overwhelming um, force, and you're, you just uh, you just um, cut out for one sec when you're talking about the history of uh, Japan and Russia, and then it cut out for like, could you just repeat that sentence? Sure, sure. So, looking at how the Chinese people responded to this sort of overwhelming force of you know all these different. Uh, foreign powers piling on them, right? And how they came together and through uh, tremendous effort, tremendous uh, you know, trial and error, trying all these different things, eventually came to um, you know, first look to the model of the Russian Revolution and then later to sort of generate their own uh, their own revolutionary process. And then the idea, you know, which is is to follow up on China and look at the internationalization of the ideas from China that were generated. Um, you know, we're kind of going pretty slow, right? The the podcast, which uh, hopefully will come out next week. Um, I'm still not done with it yet. And uh, this weekly schedule is uh, I've been I've been keeping to it so far, but uh, there's going to be some some weeks where it's not going to happen, I think. Uh, but w- just with the one that should come out this next week, we'll be de- we'll be looking at Mao's turn his his turn to peasant organizing finally, and that's going to be episode twenty eight. So uh, we're kind of we we'll have done twenty eight episodes and just got to the the first uh, the first work that um, that you know, that that you see if you look at Mao's selected works, right? Which uh, if you for listeners that aren't familiar with it, that's kind of the the official Chinese um, uh, set of books of Mao, uh, you know, with with Mao's important political writings. So um, it's going to be the podcast. If you know, the podcast could be around for a very long time going through that whole process. You know, my own personal expertise is much more on uh, Latin America. That's where I've done. You know, most of my of my original research, you know, a lot of what I'm doing on China is just sort of synthesizing other people's work. Um, but, um, you know, I think for us to get to Latin America at the pace we're going, even if we come out with a podcast episode a week, it's going to take a long time. But I'm enjoying the podcast. It seems like there's a good number of other people out there who are, too. So, um, you know, if we do exhaust uh international Maoism at some point and it makes sense to keep the podcast going we're probably talking years down the line then uh, might move into looking at other things too right well who knows in a few years time what what's going to be going on in the world but um <laughs> yeah there might be some new things to write about uh but um that would be very nice <laughs> The, uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy that you had to do uh, 28 episodes or 28 hours, 28 episodes anyway, uh, before you even got to, to Mao. But it's uh, really appreciated the length, the, the, the depth that uh, I think you give the, the, the listener has um, a, great, a, a very broad depth, uh, just been able to appreciate and read uh, Mao's work or, or any of the other things uh, about it. Um, I should say as well, actually, that uh, I, I was listening to as well, uh, there's some podcast of some guy... Uh, it's called Revolutions, 
um, which is actually kind of similar. But the guy is he's some historian and uh, he's very explicitly like a liberal. And he, and he it, it's 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 quite uh, similar to yours. Actually, he goes into a lot of depth into um, I think he does like the English Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, the French Revolution and so on, the Mexican Revolution. But um, uh He's yeah, he's very explicitly a liberal, and he thinks that the revolution is is a bad thing, like he does. So it's it's a, uh, it's it's good, but but to to contrast this with, um, I don't know, I yeah, I mean obviously, uh, yeah, just 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 somebody doing something similar, but like with uh, without that bias against actual revolution. Yeah, happening. Mike Duncan's uh, Revolutions podcast. That's a, yeah, that's a that's a huge huge podcast. Um, I. Uh, Actually, I, I listened to that and uh, it was it was, you know, listening to him do that uh, made me feel like, well, why shouldn't that was that was part of what showed me that I could uh, do uh, do this. Um, and I'm you know, I think I think for somebody I mean, obviously, I, I have a I have a different perspective on um, the desirability of revolution than he does. But, you know, for someone who. Um, who's coming from his political perspective, I think, you know, he, um, he provides a lot of information that, um, you know, in an accessible way that, you know, I think that, um, you know, there's certain, he's got certain strengths to his, his podcast thing. I definitely, um, I'm still going through the learning process of, uh, reaching the level of, um, uh, what's the word? I have a, I have a academic background, obviously, and sometimes, those of us, you know, you go through 10 years of grad school and your ability to talk to regular people, even if you had it beforehand, and I think I did, can kind of get beaten out of you. So uh, I think one thing he does a good job doing is um, presenting stuff in a way that's um, pretty accessible. And I think I'm still uh, still learning to do that. So I, I appreciate if, if any, you know, listeners are of the, the podcast are listening and are willing to give me a uh, friendly critiques on uh, how to improve on that. I'm, I'm always open to, uh, to receiving uh, comments and criticism. Right. Well, I mean, I, I didn't find any, well, I mean, uh, yeah, I didn't notice any, uh, I, I find your, uh, your, your podcast very, very accessible myself. Uh, and I, I don't know, I don't think that there's anything that, uh, you know, ordinary people would, uh, I think they could still find the, uh, I mean, it's a very like tumultuous and uh, very interesting history, uh, no matter what, um, so yeah, I think there's a lot that people can can engage with. Um, could I ask you why you started your your podcast? Yeah, yeah. So basically, you know, like I said, my my background is in academia, and there's actually a ton of stuff that ton of research that's been done. If you look at the past 30, 40 years on revolutionary movements and the experience of revolution by academics like if you look at if you say look at the experience of the new left um and when people were trying trying to come up you know come up with uh how to have a, a socialist movement a revolutionary movement whatever in their own countries you know sort of you know in the 60s sort of 60s and 70s and they were looking at models from other countries. When they were looking at the history of, of Russia or the history of China or the history of anywhere else, um, well, first of all, obviously, a lot was going on in China at the time, right? So there was obviously the scholarship on what on it was going to lag behind. But, you know, what we know now about, say, the development of all the ins and outs of the peasant war in China, for example, or all the ins and outs of various aspects of the revolutionary process or the history of socialist construction in China or Russia or, or anything that happened anywhere else, really, that you might want to reference. And you know, so much work has been done on that that we actually, we actually know a lot. Now, uh, almost none of that percolates outside of academia. And, you know, it gets written about in academia with the idea that it's only get it's only going to be read by other specialists in the field or, you know, people who are, are specialists in something closely related to what the person is writing about. And, um, you know, with, with a handful of exceptions. And what gets, you know, out to the public 
is more things like, for example, there was a big biography of Mao about, I don't know, I guess it came out maybe 15 years ago, but I think it's still probably the biggest, the best selling one by just this complete anti communist, Jung Kang, uh, and her husband, um, I forget his first name, I think his last name is Halliday. Um, works that are just explicitly meant to condemn the whole experience and steer people away from thinking about the possibility of living in a different world. And what I've been, you know, and so, I mean, it's always been, it's always bothered me that here I am studying things like, you know, people's efforts of making revolution in places like Peru, Mexico, Bolivia, and the way in which there's this kind of wall between the work I'm doing in academia and who's actually reading it and what, uh, you know, and, and people who are actually interested in those ideas for non-academic purposes. Um, and that's just leaving aside the whole issue of, you know, in academia, there's lots of people who are interested in things because they're interested in it, but then there's lots of other people who are just interested in things because they've carved out a niche where they're sort of making their career based on their, you know, dominance of this, uh, these ideas, which, you know, can be a kind of sickening thing when you're to look at when you're dealing with, you know, ideas having to do with like, you know, people's liberation from having millions of people starve to death, you know, or not, right? Um, so I guess sort of the final straw for me was seeing that seeing the, the blooming of all these podcasts, the low bar of entry, the ability to, to actually reach an audience with this stuff, and looking at the sort of whole new generation of people, you know, even in a country like the United States, being attracted to the idea of socialism. Um, right? We have just tons of young people who've been politicized uh, in the past few years. Um, and uh, for the most part, they're really not aware of the history of what's happened connected to the ideas that they're putting forward. And this, you know, I'm not criticizing them for that. You know, you, when you come forward, you're not going to be aware of what happened, but also there's not really a very strong um, left to actually educate people about, about that history. So, and to the degree people, a lot of people are aware of it. Obviously, I'm generalizing a lot, but there are a lot of patinations, right? There's, on the one hand, uh, people being attracted to the idea, young people being attracted to the idea of socialism who, um, you know, are very influenced by, by liberal summations of the socialist experience or anti-communist or summations of the, of, the, of the socialist experience. But then also a lot of, um, a lot of ideas about just how, okay, there were a lot of mistakes and failures, right? Obviously, we came through the 20th century. You know, we managed to get to the end of the 20th century. And, you know, it's a very, very contradictory process that the whole world went through. And, you know, there's a lot of pat summations about, well, we'll just avoid those failures in the future or we won't do what they did. And, you know, there's not really a reckoning uh, with the material forces that, um, that impinge on people who are making who are trying to trying to to realize some sort of socialist transformation of of their country or the world and i really feel like um i wanted i felt like what i could contribute is um is to is to is to lay out how those processes develop how those difficulties arrive what are you might decide you want to do one thing but then reality is going to intervene other other people the political forces are energy are going to intervene your ideas about what you can actually do might not actually match you know reality um and then you have to adjust your ideas that's just a natural process of things and so um that's part of the reason why i mean that's a, that's a huge part of the reason why i want i try to go into as much depth as I can without just bogging down and never moving forward with, um, you know, sort of the chronological chronological advancement of the, um, of the podcast. Right. So that, so that people who are listening can get a sense of 
of all that because um you know i i want to and also also because we're we're going to get up to some pretty um some pretty difficult times um right we're in the podcast right now we're about in 1925 in china in 1927 there's going to be you know spoiler alert <laughs> um it's there's going to be some huge huge issues happening um and how the Chinese Communist Party evaluates those things. The, what what happens is going to be, you know, I want to spend some time on that. And, uh, yeah. So I mean, obviously, the idea is not to reproduce what happened in China or to reproduce what happened in Russia, but to to improve on it, to be, but to to prepare people to the degree that I can contribute to, you know, to the degree I can gain an audience and. And can and be one voice in, in the various voices that that all these young people are are consuming in their intellectual development as as they move towards trying to, to move us towards a socialist world. Um, that is, uh, you know, the idea is that this podcast can be a contribution to that and can also break me away from, you know, mainly having an academic audience. Um, yeah, that's, right. Yeah, no, though that's a fascinating answer into the, the background why you're doing this. And I would definitely say from listening to the podcast that there, even though this is happening, uh, the, the events you're talking about are happening in the other side of the world and 100 or so years ago, the, there uh, there's a, a, a huge amount of relevance to the kind of things that people are, are facing today. So I think uh, people can definitely get a lot of um, a lot of uh, value from 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 listening to it to be able to um, yeah be able to empathize or or whatever or put themselves that they would be able to see that they're in in a similar a similar type of situation. Um, could I ask you how has the podcast been going and what kind of response have you gotten from from people so far? It's been good. You know, I really um, I had no idea what to expect or whether you know it would require some sort of promotion or not when I first started it. Um, you know, I just sort of put the put the podcast episodes out in the void. It was probably coming out with one about every on average every three weeks initially, um, and there was an initial audience that was um, larger than I thought it would be. It wasn't. It was. You know, you kind of think about you, you throw something on the internet and it goes out in the void, and where does it go? You know, does anybody see it? Um, uh, I, that's how Twitter is for me. I, I don't know how to use Twitter at all. And so that's what happens with me whenever I do something on Twitter. But um, but for this, for whatever reason, I think I think there's um, there's clearly a. Um, there's clearly a desire for a podcast like this out there, because this 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 found an audience right away. It wasn't a huge audience, but even in a few episodes, there was, you know, I mean, it was less than 100 people for sure, but it was like right away, boom, there were people listening. Um, then, um, you know, over time, more and more people found it. You know, it's been coming out a little over a year now. Uh, about the past three months or so, I moved to having episodes out every week. Um, as soon as I did the weekly episode thing a few times in a row, um, audience numbers really went up. I think, um, I think it's just a fact that people, people expect podcasts, people are conditioned to expect podcasts to come out more or less weekly. And, um, I don't know, you keep the attention of your audience, um, better that way. That's, that's all I can think of. Maybe quite possibly there's some, you show up better on the algorithms that, uh, let people know your podcast exists too. Once you start doing that, um, you know, those, those algorithms r remain a mystery to me. And I, um, but, um, you know, I launched an episode now I get a good chunk of people listening, uh, around the world too. I'd say a, a little under half my audience is in the U S, um, nice size audience, pretty much on every continent except Antarctica. Um, you know, I mean, when I say nice size though, I'm not, we're not talking huge. Um, definitely, you know, just a few hundred regular listeners, I would say at this point. Uh, but, um, the potential for growth and given that there's been like, this is the first interview I've done with anybody about the podcast. And I think with some promotion, with some, you know, with getting the word out there one way or another, 
there's clearly um, a built-in audience for this show. There's clearly people out there who want something like this. Um, you know, my but uh, in terms of the feedback I get from people, that's uh, you know my biggest concern is I know the audience is out there. The question for me is, am I um, answering the questions that people have? Am I meeting the needs? You know, or am I just you know going off in my own head about what I think is important? So it's um, to the I've, I to the extent that I can get feedback from listeners, I get you know I've got um, a certain number of people, let's say ten to fifteen people who you know sort of contact me, get in touch, you know, I get some feedback from. But um, I'd like more. Um, and, you know, so I, I've been encouraging people at the end of the shows recently to, to get in touch. And I appreciate you getting in touch for sure. Um, and hearing your feedback on the show. Um, so, you know, that's sort of, you know, the sort of um, my, my question is, can I, you know, can I meet the needs of the audience that's clearly out there? And um, some sort of... Uh, back and forth process with the audience, um, which is growing, but not at the pace I'd like, uh, is, uh, is clearly necessary for, um, for that to happen. So, uh, yeah, we'll see. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I suppose it's, uh, it's, uh, inevitable, like, uh, it, I guess it takes its own time. You can't, uh, you can't force the process. But if uh, people are, are consistently listening to us, um, uh, then then that's uh, that's the that's a big um, piece of uh, uh, positive feedback in itself. Um, I would say as well that unfortunately, uh, if this is uh, if this is the first um, interview you've done, uh, our our um, social media reach is is, is pretty small itself. Um, so you know, I died, but uh, it, it's a, it's a good start anyway um yeah that's that's the nature of um that's the position that people who uh believe in making people free from this system have been put in at this point that's just uh objectively what we're facing right yeah uh i think uh, people will naturally try to it's because like the the entire topic i guess is is developing a uh uh, a following and people will I, I suppose naturally try to find it and yeah I, I guess things will go from there I suppose it just yeah it takes its time to for people to digest it before they start to have opinions but um yeah so it, it, yeah so it, it sounds uh, it sounds great anyway um so just as well like what uh, so is the podcast leading towards uh something something bigger like or something in the future uh could you could you speak to that a bit yeah so I've pretty much put aside at this point my academic work that is mainly directed at an academic audience. It's the sort of thing that I've never been entirely comfortable with, and but that you kind of have to do if you want to have a job in academia. But um, at this point, I've decided to, um, you know, I, I feel a lot better about doing this podcast than about a lot of other academic work I've done, and um, I really like you know, reaching a broader audience, and I want this history to connect with people. Um, and so I'm sort of viewing this podcast as kind of a really rough draft of a larger project, um, maybe a book, maybe something else, you know, sort of on the history of international Maoism. Um, so this is you know, this is the main thing I'm doing right now. Right now, it's mainly taking podcast form, but um, the idea is to develop this into a book or several books, or maybe some other form of some other form of presentation of this material in just whatever the best way is to reach the broadest number of people um, on this this history of um, of international Maoism. There was a recent book. Um, that came out on global Maoism um, by Julia Lovell. I think that's really the, the first big book on international Maoism um, to come out, certainly to come out in a, in a very long time, you know, and that's aimed at a, um, a broad audience. And that book 
you know, has done very well. So there's, um, you know, there's a lot, there's clearly a very, you know, an audience for that in the general population, the general, among the general reading public, as well as among people who are more um, interested in the ideas uh, because they're grappling with some of those ideas um, or would like to be grappling with some of those ideas. Um, so um, I think, um, you know, but I don't have a book contract yet for this or anything. So, you know, and I'm not entirely sure a book is the best way to go, but this is, this is, this is, this is my work at this point. Great. Yeah, well, it's, it's great work. Um, could you talk about your previous research and how it's led to, uh, how it's fed into this project? Sure, sure. Um, so, um, my, uh, I have a PhD in history, um, Latin American history with strong uh, secondary fields in Chinese and uh, world history. Uh, and so I, I did um, uh, my, uh, my PhD research eventually became a book called Trans-Pacific Revolutionaries, the Chinese Revolution in Latin America, which sort of surveys the, um, the transference of uh, Maoist ideas to Latin America, in particular looking at case studies in Mexico, Bolivia, and Peru. Um, uh, and I followed that up with some articles, um, including looking um, a short biographical piece that I think a, a lot of people would be interested in um, on Jose Venturelli, uh, who was a Chilean member of the Chinese Communist Party um, and who uh, worked to promote uh, Maoism in Latin America. Very He's, he's, he's mainly known, actually, as an artist because he was a very, very successful artist, but um, he was also a um, secretly a member of the Chinese Communist Party um, and uh, just had an incredibly interesting life. I wrote a short article, a short political biography of him as an article um, appeared in uh, the journal Radical America in the first issue of that. It can be found on the web pretty easily. Um, so, uh, so I've worked on Latin American Maoism um, quite a bit. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a specialist mainly in Latin America, although I've, you know, I've worked in China and uh, and read a lot of Chinese history. Um, obviously, if I didn't read a lot of Chinese history, this would be a pretty bogus podcast. <laughs> um, but um, uh, so that's you know, this is a pretty natural extension of um, of what I worked on. But you know. Like I said, it was always a contradiction for me that I was um, producing this work on these uh, political movements in Latin America, but that the main audience, although I've always I've always managed to have some audience that wasn't just academic, um, you know, the main audience for it and the main way in which, which it was being evaluated was not in terms of its um, value, the value of my work to society or the value of my work to putting, pushing society towards, um, you know, a better world, but rather, um, you know, just in terms of academic career advancement and that, uh, you know, that was not, um, that was not, I was not happy with the fact that that was the main way in which my, uh, research was being, uh, dealt with in the world. So, Anyways, this has been a pretty natural progression um, in terms of the topic, but um, a pretty major departure in terms of um, intended audience um, with, you know, with with some major uh, repercussions in terms of the form of presentation of the work. Right. Well, the the research you've done, I, I had no like the, the stories and topics you had done and you're done research on and that you are uh, invoking in the podcast I had no clue about so I can't comment to comment on it except for the fact that it's uh, really fascinating and I'm uh, very uh, curious and eager to, to learn to learn more about these stories um, but just to I guess take one step back um, I suppose in terms of how uh, take a step back from your own work, but like maybe to look at some of the revolutionary media or other types of um, communication or other types of projects which are trying to bring such information to to people. 
Um, would you would you be able to, would you have any thoughts on how that is at the moment? For example, uh, what are some some tasks that if you to to for those people collectively trying to to uh, to promote that kind of uh, information? What do, what should they be doing? Oh man, I have a hard enough time setting tasks for myself. I can't I can't tell anybody else what to do. Um, I, I you know I honestly I have no idea. The current media landscape is um, uh, I want to blame it on my age, but I don't know. It's probably not just that. I it's it's kind of bewildering to me. I um I love podcasts and audiobooks. So for me, it was really natural to start a podcast. And um, but um, aside from that, I just you know, how people, I look at, say, attempts to utilize YouTube or to utilize other forms of social media, um, you know, the, you know, the new media landscape. Uh, and I, I just don't see um, any really successful, um, you know, effort to any, any really successful putting out of you know, radical ideas and these or radical left ideas, at least in these in this context. I'm sure if, if I sat down, I could think of a couple of exceptions to that. But uh, in general, it doesn't seem like uh, uh, it seems hard. And I really don't I don't have any answer on how to do it. I mean, when I, I'm not criticizing anybody for like not doing a better job because I have no clue. I mean, what I what I do see is that there seems to be a real tendency of sort of the nature of the interchange on social media platforms to push people towards um what's the term is the term edgelordism um is to push people towards taking 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 ideas that are um that are ridiculous right that are so um that are so radical or so i mean i don't that are so Ideas that just seem crazy, and I, I can understand why. I mean, you look at Twitter, for example, and that, and that's like the nature of the, the the that's the nature of how people engage with each other on there, right? Is is to, to be sort of funny or ridiculous in a certain sense. I don't know. Maybe I only look at weird Twitter, but um, you know, you see, for example, these um, uh. Well, I don't. I don't want to single out any particular uh, person or, or trend because it, it will be, be misinterpreted. But um, I don't know. You, you, there's a lot of expression. Now I'm talking about individuals and not larger paths for people trying to engage in this um, process. But I don't know. I just don't. I, I, I guess the real answer is I just don't. I don't. I have no clue how to how to engage with this media landscape. I wish I did. Um, you know, I I sat down for a second and was like, "What can I do in relation to this?" And a podcast seemed workable. But you know, what's your guys' experience? You you guys have a YouTube channel. I mean, how do you? What's your sense of of what people should be doing? Well, um, yeah, we have a, a media kind of little media team. Um, I would say that our our uh, our content or the stuff that we produce is pretty good. But we still have a minuscule. Following, I think one like one of the issues is, uh, you know, it's kind of ine- inevitable. We, you know, we uh, all of these platforms, all these social media platforms. I mean, the the the, the main the old mainstream media, the newspapers, television, and everything else are 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 totally controlled. Um, but uh, but just as much so are the uh, the social media platforms. So you know, it's kind of inevitable that we'll have a a minuscule following because you know uh, all of our like, yeah, all of our accounts, whenever they start to become popular, which they do become popular, but they get shut down or they get, um, you know, ma- they get made invisible, all, all this kind of thing. So, you know, it's kind of inevitable that, that we can't really, you know, it's, uh, we can't really use these. We can, we can, to the best of our ability, use these platforms to give a message, but that's going to be very limited inevitably. It's interesting that across the world, many people are coalescing around uh kind of yeah radical ideas and and around uh maoism i guess the question that i asked you was kind of unfair because like nobody really has the <laughs> solution but if anyone but if if people had maybe a few thoughts so i mean i don't know the the history but uh something like you know maybe the rim uh 
a few decades ago if they if that if that was around today how would they be promoting their their message or trying to bring their message to the people i, I suppose maybe maybe we could be coming to a similar uh situation again so so maybe we should, people should think collectively about how to uh like you know you're doing a podcast maybe some other group uh could be doing other other things i don't know it's it's only just uh, speculation but just oh, i thought no. i uh, Actually, I'm, I'm glad I'm glad you I'm glad you, you I'm glad you said this because actually you there is there is one there's one thing I, I have I have thought about this a little bit um, is that one when you look at the successful um, the people who are who are who are successful in in some of these media um, particularly say you look at um, look at some of these sort of you know left liberal folks who've managed to you know who who tend to be pretty marginalized, you know, like, like some of the rest of us, but who've uh, maybe they've got a little bit more larger mass base, um, and but they've um, uh, but they've managed to be relatively successful within this landscape. I think one uh, common characteristic that they that that they have and that you can you can see in their success is that you have you have different sets of people who uh, sort of support and promote each other. Um, and I mean, you can call it, I mean, you can look at that sort of negatively and critically and just say, oh, they've just got these mutual promotion societies. But on the other hand, like they have a certain, um, even though they're doing different things, they have a sense of themselves as part of um as you know, they, they don't necessarily agree with each other 100 percent, but they have a sense of their of themselves as part of a um, part of a field of people who like what each other is doing, are in dialogue with each other and promote each other. And that sort of cross promotion ends up building all of their audiences. And um, that is um, that is something I don't see happening a lot uh on the political terrain sort of to the left of that left liberal um milieu yeah that's true um I, yeah i do think that that kind of cross promotional cluster type thing is probably the best thing that we could do on these social media platforms that we don't control uh and i i, I suppose maybe one thing i uh, it's kind of my impression that these the the left liberal kind of groups have been around for a while um and maybe like more radical ones are a bit newer so maybe it could be a problem of it's just a bit uh maybe it takes time to form those networks or not i mean i don't know or maybe they're more more fractured who knows but yeah i would i would agree that that's the the right uh the right uh, the, the best we can do really yeah yeah i mean I, that, obviously that's not a huge uh huge insight on my part but just just an observation um yeah yeah well it's not it's not being done so you know yeah it would be a simple thing to do um well i guess that's uh, the, the only question is uh, i have is if you have any final words uh, would you is there anything else you'd like to uh, comment on or mention or talk about um well i feel like i've gone on a lot longer than i thought i would <laughs> um uh you know, it's funny. You uh, you think about what you're going to say beforehand, but then you start talking, and you just keep talking. That's, at least that's what I do. <laughs> uh, no, no, I, I think um, you know I'd really like people to listen to the podcast. If you do listen to it, I would love to hear what you think. You know, what you like, what you don't like, how I can improve. Um, if you have questions that aren't being answered by the podcast, I'd really like to know. Um, you know, I want to know what what sort of questions people who you know, are interested in these topics, what kind of questions are you grappling with? And then, you know, if I can, to what degree I can help contribute to, um, to your thinking on those questions. Um, that's it. I really appreciate you, um, you know, small social media presence or not, you know, uh, interviewing me. Many thanks to Matt. And please go to People's History of Ideas to catch up on this excellent podcast.